No intro this time. Let's just get into it. Myth 1. Psychopathy isn't real. This has been going around lately, and it's just not true. No one in the psychological slash psychiatric world puts psychopathy in quotation marks. It's very much a real diagnosis that uses very real psychological and medical techniques. It isn't in the DSM or the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, a very creatively named guidebook for mental health professionals published by the American Psychiatric Association, and people see that and they go, checkmate! Psychopathy isn't in the DSM, therefore psychopathy isn't real. But no, the reason it isn't in the DSM is because we, as mental health professionals, do not alone diagnose psychopathy. We can diagnose related disorders, which we'll get to later, but along with the use of interview or self-report inventories that are consistently being updated to this day, a diagnosis of psychopathy also requires a look into family history, genetics, as well as functional brain imaging. Yes, you can see a psychopathic brain on an fMRI. It's super real. Myth 2. Psychopathy and sociopathy are two different things and you need to stop mixing them up. Sorry, they're not. In common parlance, people say that psychopathy is inborn, whatever that means, and sociopathy is developed, whatever that means. But we don't really know a whole ton about the etiology, either the nature or the nurture side of psychopathy or sociopathy, or whatever you want to call it. We don't have a psychopathy gene, or in utero conditions, so the distinction is really moot. And no one in the field makes a distinction either. The inventories, brain imaging, family histories, historical analyses, all that psychometric stuff is applied to psychopathy. And I've never actually seen anyone in the field of psychology, um, criminology is another matter, see reference to, actually make the distinction. So if you ever find yourself on Reddit typing, actually, you mean sociopathy, which is developed over a person's life. Like, like, no, please, please stop, stop doing that. You're not only being pedantic, but you're being wrong. Myth 3. Psychopathy is actually just antisocial personality disorder. I've even had professionals say this to me offhandedly, and it isn't true. There is a whole lot of comorbidity. That is, if you have antisocial personality disorder, or ASPD, you stand a strong chance of also having psychopathic personality. But it doesn't mean you definitely do. ASPD does not necessitate a few things that psychopathy requires, or at least implies, including high levels of charisma and a neurologically evidenced inability to feel empathy. There's something of a track of disorders we can follow in the development of what can be diagnosed as psychopathy in adulthood that starts from childhood with oppositional defiant disorder, or ODD, moving into conduct disorder, or CD, in adolescence, and then ASPD, which is usually not diagnosed until adulthood, and then finally, psychopathy, which isn't considered a disorder. That's right, it's rarely, if ever, called a disorder in scientific literature because, above and beyond ASPD, it doesn't necessitate significant distress or impairment of personal functioning. Which brings us to... Myth 4. Psychopathy is a disability. You're being ableist. No, it ain't. Psychopathy is actually extremely adaptive. I've met and worked with a lot of psychopaths and never has one of them suggested that they wish they weren't. Psychopathy is often a boon, which we'll discuss in a second here. The prevalence of psychopathy is also a rigid 1.2% all around the world, no matter which country you're in. See reference 1. And the running theory that I was educated with is because it is so adaptive, as long as it can fly under the radar. A lack of empathy can be really great for someone who wants to, you know, get the most out of their society and give nothing back. But if they become too prevalent, people become more hyper-aware of them, and their adaptability is lost. Thus the rather stable value. Myth 5. Psychopathy is criminality. Not necessarily. I really want to emphasize this part of the video. Psychopathy has a place. We don't want to, like, line up all psychopaths against the wall. Psychopathy lends itself to a number of very crucial professions, for instance, psychopaths are heavily overrepresented as surgeons. You can imagine that a lack of empathy would make it a whole lot easier to keep your focus while literally cutting open a human being. They also actually make great journalists. I personally think this is because it helps to have an objective, big picture, blow for blow account when writing the news, rather than giving in to the more neurotypical temptation of hyper focusing on the individual human aspect, especially of some heavier stories. 
And for that matter, I really want to say, just because someone is a criminal, even a violent criminal, even an absolute bloody piece of work, it doesn't mean they can't be a productive member of society. It doesn't mean they can't have a life. Even if it takes constant two-to-one human support, which some of my clients need, they still have a place in our world. They might never have a real deep feeling relationship with somebody, but honestly, they don't really want to. Maybe that sounds sad. That's just how it is. They're still human. Myth six, psychopathy can be treated. This is the really hard one for people to swallow. Since at least the 80s, with Robert Hare's first psychological inventories for psychopathic personality traits, we've been looking into how to help people who rank highly on them not rank highly on them. And it worked. They'd go through the system and they'd not rank highly anymore on the tests. That is to say, they were still very much psychopaths, they just knew better how to not look like psychopaths. They just became, as one of my professors put it, better at being psychopaths. Psychopathic traits, along with the high charisma and the lack of empathy that I mentioned before, as well as the traits of ASPD, which you can also read up on, also concern a great capacity and willingness to lie and manipulate. This makes psychopaths rather, not necessarily hard, but circular to spot, because if they sense that it'll benefit them to convince you that they aren't a psychopath, they will. Myth 7. Psychopathy is actually pretty cool. I haven't actually heard anybody say this, but I, I stuck it in because I didn't know how else to segue into the section. But I want to emphasize this too, because even if nobody says this verbatim, they sure do act like it, perhaps without realizing. One position I didn't mention as having the greatest ratio of psychopaths of all is, of course, CEOs, according to Kevin Dutton, a world leader in the field. That big man you aspire to being, the girl boss you idolize, and certainly, obviously, people like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk that have edgy young men drooling all over their fancy shoes, chances are they all rank very highly on psychopathic personality traits. And I mean, of course they do. When you have enough money to single-handedly end world poverty and just choose to go to space and then come home and then buy Twitter instead, I'll go off the record here and say you're probably a dang psychopath. I mean... I've never seen Elon Musk's PPI-R scores, or seen any images at all of his living brain meats, but like, we can be pretty sure, right? These aren't good people, they're people using their adaptive traits for pure evil, and we need to understand one very important thing. Not only are they not our friends, they are physically, neurologically incapable of being our friends. They feel nothing for you. They don't even know the meaning of the word. Again, that doesn't mean they deserve to die or something, just that they shouldn't be running our world, right? Politicians and clergymen, incidentally, also have a very high psychopathy prevalence. We need to look out for this stuff, be aware of the traits of psychopaths, and not let it happen. Oh, and that very unscientific stuff that you see now and again that really seems to have come out of nowhere at all about how psychopathy isn't real or how it's ableist language when, if you read any literature at all or speak to literally anyone in the relevant fields, nothing could be further from the truth. Wonder where all that rhetoric came from. Tim Adams of The Guardian wrote of Dutton's The Wisdom of Psychopaths, his analysis tends to reinforce the idea that the chemistry of megalomania which characterizes the psychopathic criminal mind is a close cousin to the set of traits often best rewarded by capitalism. But that's probably none of my business.